The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to our Sudden Cardiac Arrest Month webinar. My name is Ryan Eborn and I am here today on behalf of the marketing team with School Health. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and for participating in our webinar with Sean Sima, who, along with his family, leads the nonprofit organization Lexi's Lifesavers. This is an organization that works to train as many future rescuers as possible and works to donate AEDs to families and organizations who need them the most. In today's webinar, we're going to be discussing some important information about sudden cardiac arrest, about AEDs, CPR, and cardiac emergency response plans. And as we've taken a look at the feedback we've received from our past webinars, we've noticed that one of the most frequent questions we are asked is about funding for AED programs. Therefore, we've asked Sean to spend some time uh, researching uh, funding solutions that can provide financial assistance for your AED program. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Cardiac Science, who is our partner for this uh, webinar. We partner with Cardiac Science each year for Sudden Cardiac Arrest Month to help spread awareness about the importance of AEDs in schools and, uh, and just really to get information about AEDs and CPR out there. And we really appreciate everything that Cardiac Science does to support this program. Before I turn the time over to Sean, I'd like to review a few quick things about today's webinar. We will not be taking audio questions, but you can submit your questions through the questions interface and go to webinar. Um, go ahead and submit your questions anytime during the presentation. Uh, Sean will speak for about 45 minutes, and then after uh, he has finished the presentation, we will take your questions in the order in which they were received. This webinar will be recorded and we will post the, the playback of the webinar recording on the schoolhealth.com site. We will also email you a link uh, to the recorded presentation um, that will come probably this afternoon. So keep an eye out from that, for that email if you're, if you're wanting to review this or to share it with others. Um, we'll also be providing a certificate of attendance for joining us today and the email that you received this afternoon with your recorded presentation will also contain a link for you to download that certificate of attendance. Lastly, if you are having technical difficulties with the audio or visual portion of today's webinar, please call GoToWebinar directly at 855-352-9008. Again, the number for GoToWebinar is 855-352-9003. And now I will turn the time over to Sean. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Sean Sima. Um, I'm down in Melbourne, Florida. And uh, it's a privilege uh, to be able to take this opportunity uh, to speak to everybody. I'm, I'm truly honored uh, by the School Health and Cardiac Science uh, team uh, for asking me to do this. Uh, this is something that's really near and dear to me from both a personal standpoint, but also a professional standpoint. I'm a 20-year uh, uh, physician's assistant. I do orthopedics. I did primary care for six years before I did my internship, um, and I'm retired uh, from the United States Air Force. Um, so here's our story. Um, I'm, I'm the guy and we're the family that had it all, you know, the Post Guard family. Uh, we did, like I said, our family did 20 years in the military. I grew up, um, you know, we didn't have much uh, and, and the military gave me everything. Um, they sent me to school and I served in uh, several wars um, and I retired in 2012. We had a big, beautiful home. We had a nice car. Uh, we were, like I said, the postcard family. We had everything but the white picket fence, and that's only because our HOA wouldn't allow it. So everything sort of changed for us on February 2nd, 2016. Uh, we were at a, um, a lacrosse benefit for my son, and um, my daughter, Lexi, at the time, 
uh, was playing softball and she had played every single sport. She was the picture of health. She's five foot nine and she's beautiful and she was strong and, and never had really any medical problems at all. So that night she was gonna meet us at the restaurant uh, where we were having the cross benefit um, after her game. So I, we told her there's a little bit of a wait, hurry up. So she decides, you know, being the gym rat that she is, that she's gonna swing by the gym, which was about a block away from where we were at. A um, few minutes later, we're sitting now, our head coach is a judge in the local area, right? So my phone starts blowing up. You don't answer the phone when Judge Crawford is talking. So ignore, 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 ignore. And then finally, this message comes through at 757. And if you're a parent, that last line there says it all. That's the line that you never, ever, ever want to see. One block, I ran. I ran out the door and I sprinted. I couldn't think straight. I, I didn't grab my keys. I left my phone. I left my wallet. And I just ran out the door. By the time I got to the gym, the ambulance and the fire truck was pulling up. So in my mind, I'm thinking, what am I about to find? Also, myself, I was about to have a heart attack. And this is what I saw. I went into the gym and this is what I saw. Now, you know, most of us are, are medical people that are on this broadcast. This looks like a picture that you see in every CPR manual. But that is my dead daughter. My daughter is lying there dead. The gentleman taking her pulse had just taken a CPR class. Here's another picture of my daughter dead. These were taken by Big Mike, who sent me that last text. His best friend owned a gym. And the litigious society that we live in, he started taking pictures to make sure that there was no grounds for a lawsuit. And at the time, I thought that's really, really weird. And up to last year, when I did this talk, I couldn't look at these pictures. But now I want everybody to see them because this says it all. This is what happens when you step forward and you do something and you don't let somebody die. This is her greatest title. She's a survivor. You know, you can cue the Destiny Child music, you know, I'm a survivor. Not a good singer, but thank God I'm tall, dark, and handsome. Really not. I'm the complete opposite. But you all get the picture. My daughter is alive because four people stepped up and saved her life and did CPR. The people sitting at the desk at the gym had no idea what to do but dial 911. The trainers that were there, believe it or not, had no idea what to do. They stood around and they were gonna wait for the ambulance to come. But these four, four people in the back of the gym, they stepped forward and they did something about it. Here they are. They're our heroes. That's Lexi in the front. One of the pe uh, people that were there that night, a girl named Amanda, couldn't make it for the picture. But there's uh, a retired Air Force guy, a retired New York cop, um, and a lifeguard. Because of these people, and I get choked up every time. <clears throat> because of these people, I got to see my daughter graduate last year. Because of these people, I'm going to have a chance to see her graduate nursing school. Because of these people, I hope to one day walk my daughter down the aisle. Because of these people, I hope to one day hold my grandchild. That's what's at stake, what we're, we're gonna talk about today. I love those people. This is what changed my life. This is Lexi's cardiologist. And the first night I met him, he told me that my daughter was gonna have to get a defibrillator put in her chest. And I looked at him like he was crazy. And I said, a defibrillator? And these words have always stuck with me. Mr. Seema, you have no idea what just happened to your family. Only seven out of a hundred people survived what just happened to your daughter. And I was in shock. Like I said, I'm a 20 year PA. And I don't say that to be braggadocious, like I'm super smart. I tell people that because I felt like a dummy. I felt uneducated. I felt like, like how did I not know this? So we were in the hospital for two weeks. 
and I started doing research and I started looking through all the facts and all the figures and I was astounded. And people ask me, well, why are you so passionate? Why are you trying to do so much in this world? And it's because number one, I made the deal with God when I looked at my dead daughter on the ground. Number two, if me as a medical provider with 20 years of experience didn't know this information, how is a football coach gonna know it? How is a gym teacher gonna know it? How is a lady teaching algebra supposed to know that? So that's what put us, that's what put us on, on this path. And this is what I learned doing my research. A heart attack, that's the same thing as sudden cardiac arrest, right? Didn't your daughter have a heart attack? I hear that over and over again. It wasn't a heart attack. There's a difference. Sudden cardiac arrest is a plumbing problem. It's a clogged artery. You get a little, some chest pain, you get shortness of breath, you get the sweat, you get nausea. Basically, you have time. Sudden cardiac arrest is something completely different. It's an electrical problem. Now, I will tell you that a heart attack can lead to sudden cardiac arrest, but they're different. It's electrical. Your heart has electricity going through that. I never fully understood that, to be honest with you. As a medical provider, I didn't understand that. But sudden cardiac arrest is lethal. My daughter was dead before her body ever hit the ground. She was running on a treadmill and she died midair. So what about statistics? This was my face. This was my face. I was, really? This is what's going on? So every year, or excuse me, every day, a thousand people die in our country from sudden cardiac arrest. Four plane loads of people crash every single day. Anywhere from 325 to 400, the statistics sort of vary, but over 325, that's pretty well established. Those you know, people die every single year in the United States. Right now, only 10% survive. That means if you have 100 people laying on the ground in today's environment, only one is getting up. With quick recognition and fast response, over half of them can get up. Now that you might think, ah, eh, well, that's great, but you think about it when one of those is your loved one. What about, what about at home? Most of your sudden cardiac arrests don't happen in the hospital. They happen at your house. So what does that mean? And it's probably going to be your loved one. And you're going to find out what you do in the first really one to three, three to five minutes is going to determine if that person is going to live and it's going to determine the legacy of your family forever. Let's look at this. So sudden cardiac arrest, we'll say like the American heart, 325,000 people every single year. Look at every one of these uh, other um, you know, problems in our country, firearms, suicide, drug overdose. We can't talk enough about any of these issues, motor vehicle accidents. But if you do the math and you add up every single one of these, they barely equal the number of people that die from sudden cardiac arrest. Where are the TV commercials for this? Why are we talking about everything but this? It makes no sense. How about you guys? The number one killer of student athletes is sudden cardiac arrest. The number one killer on school campus is sudden cardiac arrest. It's not guns. The number one killer of NCAA athletes is sudden cardiac arrest, not concussions and broken necks. The number one killer in the workplace is sudden cardiac arrest. Pretty much, if anyone ever asks you what's the number one killer of anything, you're gonna look like you're super smart because if you say sudden cardiac arrest, there's a high chance that you're gonna be right. Let's break it down a little bit more. How many kids die per year from sudden cardiac arrest? Statistics show at least 7,000. That's approximately 20 kids a day every single day in the United States. We don't hear about it because you might have one in Florida, one in Oregon, two in New York. You know, it's not like our school shootings where, you know, the news media converges down on one high school, but approximately 20 kids under the age of 18 die every day. 
Approximately one in 300 kids are walking your hallways with a heart condition that put them at risk to die. This one blows me away. So approximately one in every 25 schools in the United States is going to have somebody dead on campus. Now, it might be a kid. It might be a teacher. It might be the custodian. It might be the father in the stands at the football game. It might be grandma showing up to see uh, junior, you know, perform in the school play. I just did the math a little while ago. So there's 100,032, what, excuse me, 132,853 schools in the United States. Do the math. That's a lot of people. And that's where you guys step in. Are you ready? So CPR, I love this one. You know, I had to throw this in. You know, this is sort of where we're at. We don't have an excuse, you know, short arm disease. That's one thing that my kids always say when they ask me for money, but it goes in our, our society today. People are not ready to respond. Well, let's, let's look at, at, at state requirements. And this is new to me. I'm a big advocate of every kid in the United States learning CPR in school. I took for granted that most states in the country have laws that say, yeah, the, the teacher, somebody needs to know CPR on campus. So as you can see here, the, uh, the states in red, they do have some legislation on that. Look at all the other ones, including my Florida. It's embarrassing. We're not a third world country. We're the most powerful country in the world. And here's just a breakdown. One thing that I found really, really interesting was Colorado. They have a requirement for one person on campus to, to, you know, to know CPR. The majority of the rest, it's gym teachers, driver's ed teachers, but that's just not enough. It's not enough. So who should know CPR? The school nurse, that's a given, right? We're all medical people. We're, we should know CPR. Coaches and athletic trainers, yes, because 66% of kids that drop dead usually drop dead while they're doing some kind of an athletic activity. Teachers, yes, they should know it because they're usually the first responders. They're usually the ones that are right there when the kid goes down in class. And we'll just fly through these other ones here. Administrative staff, the resource officer, which is basically a cop, here in Florida, we have security specialists on every campus, you know, a volunteer that comes into the school, bus drivers, Florida just passed the requirement for all bus drivers to know CPR. What about the custodial staff? Facility crew, you know, those are the lawn guys. You know, it's basically everybody. Students, you know, when we teach these kids how to save, uh, save lives, You've got 20 lifesavers sitting in every classroom on campus, but basically everybody, 100% of, of the first three nurse, coaches, and teachers should know CPR. And I'm talking, you don't have to have the full certification. We're going to talk about something that that's, that's can be taught in 10 minutes. Most people probably already know how to do it, and it's hands-only CPR. You know, us as medical people, we need to know the full CPR. But, you know, most people in the United States and don't do CPR on a stranger. They don't want to put their mouths on people. They don't want to get involved. They don't want to get sued. But hands-only CPR takes the math out of it. We all remember the days where it was 30 and 2, 15 and 2, uh, you know, depending on age and all that, you had to try to remember all that math. And if you don't do it every single day, it's, you, you just forget it. But now, you know, it's three simple steps. Call 911, call for an AED, and start doing CPR. And again, here it is. Call, push, shock. Three simple steps. When you go blank, which you're going to, if and when it happens to you, you are not going to remember anything. Take three seconds. What do I do? 911, call for the AED and start doing compressions. We shouldn't have to wait for the nurse or definitely don't wait for the fire trucks to show up. 
And again, the AED, we call that the, the finger of God. It, it's the control alt delete button. It's the turn the computer off and turn it back on, restart. This is the thing that saves people's lives. There's no doubt about it. So one thing I didn't even realize, this is sort of a new development, but our, our, you know, women do not get the same treatment when it comes down to CPR. You know, this is this was super shocking. You know, 27% more women die every single year from sudden cardiac arrest. And why is that? And it's sort of shocking. They're more likely to die because people are afraid for a multitude of reasons. I didn't know this, but since 1984, more women have died than men from sudden cardiac arrest. So what do you do? We all pretty much, I can guarantee everybody on this call right now would, would step in. But why are people less likely to step in, right? We live in a very litigious society. People are ready to sue for everything. So therefore, we don't react. We're afraid. We're afraid we're going to be accused of sexual harassment for inappropriate touching. You know, we're, we're afraid uh, of causing physical injury, right? Women are more delicate. But I'm telling you, if you snap some ribs, and they survive, they're alive. If you do nothing, if you turn and go the other way, you know, they're either hurt or they're dead. You know, you got to step in. Poor recognition, right? A lot of women don't have the, oh my God, I'm having crushing chest pain. A lot of times they get an upset stomach. A lot of times people look at women and say, oh, she's a drunk, which this blows me away, but apparently it's in the statistics. Oh, she's a drama queen. She's faking. Uh, I heard a story last year of a woman that went to the ER and was having incredible chest pain, passing out, writhing on the floor in pain, and they thought she was faking it. And by the time they came out to get her, she was dead. And again, the misconception that breasts make CPR more challenging, right? A lot of people are afraid of this. Um, you know, our current CPR mannequins, you know, they're all built like Brad Pitt and, and Zac Efron. You know, they're all ripped. You know, there's no uh, body tissue on them. But when, you know, I don't know if some people remember Dolly Parton or Sofia Vergara, when they go down, what do you do? A lot of people look and say, well, I didn't learn what to do. Do I put my hand between her breasts? What do I do? And that's where, you know, you need the training. Now, this mannequin that they're showing here is uh, set to hit the market really soon. So it's going to give people some definite, you know, hands-on training. They call this the mannequin, and it should be coming soon. This is a perfect, uh, you know, uh, map of where you put your hands. And I will tell you, if I put a picture of a man laying down, it would be the same exact thing. The one big difference is you need to remove the bra. A lot of your bras have wires in them and they can actually cause a spark and an arc with an AED. So that's just something you're gonna have to do. You wanna put your hands between the nipple line just like you do on a male. You know, if you're super concerned about exposing a lady, go ahead and put a t-shirt across the chest but that chest has to be exposed so you can do what you need to do, especially when that AED shows up. Uh, one of the gentlemen that saved my daughter actually came and apologized uh, because he exposed her when he was doing CPR. And I'm sure you know what my thoughts were. I could care less. My daughter is alive. I wouldn't care if they were taking pictures and, and, and putting them on. Well, I would care if they put them on the internet, but. It's very, very important to, you know, let, let uh, gender go out the window when you're saving lives. So cardiac emergency response plans. This is getting into the meat and potatoes of why I'm glad we're doing this talk today. What is a cardiac emergency response plan? Believe it or not, a lot of people have no clue what that is. It sounds really official. It sounds really scary. It sounds probably expensive, and it sounds like it's a lot of work. 
but basically it's a fire drill for a medical condition. It's a plan that establishes steps on how we're supposed to respond when somebody goes down in the school with a cardiac arrest. Why do we do this? Well, because right now on campus, anywhere from 92 to 95% of people die on campus. And it's usually because of chaos, 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 chaos. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but I'm gonna tell you when we're at the football game and it's fourth and one on the goal line, the coach doesn't call PA SEMA out of the stands to make the call. But yet we expect Coach Smith to know exactly what to do when a kid drops down in front of him and it's supposed to go smooth and he's supposed to save his life. He's supposed to recognize the difference between a seizure and, and sudden cardiac arrest. He's supposed to recognize the difference between agonal breathing, which is the death rattle versus normal breathing. It's not fair. And these guys are being held liable. People are being fired in Florida. They're suing like crazy. And it's not fair. Time is not on your side, right? We think when we dial 911 that they're going to show up and that they're going to save whoever it is, you know, we're gonna, they're going to save their life. You have a critical one, really one to three minutes. If, if it's more than 10 minutes and you don't do anything, the show is over. It's less than a 5% chance. So for every one minute that passes, it's another 10% less chance that that person is gonna survive. Look at this. The national average is about seven to 12 minutes. And you can start the clock when that patient or that person hits the ground you start the clock. And if you wait for the ambulance to show up before you do anything, it's the equivalent to standing over a pool and watching a kid sit at the bottom for 10 minutes before that ambulance shows up. We're not gonna do it. We're gonna jump in and save them. And that's what we need to get across right now. My daughter waited 15 minutes. She would be dead right now. She would be dead if it wasn't for those four people in that gym last night. And there are studies out there done by the University of Washington that if you can respond within one to three minutes with CPR and get an AED on and shock that kid before three minutes, nine out of 10 are getting off the floor. Nine out of 10 are resurrecting off the floor from death. Right now, we have 8%. That's it. And it's chaos, it's because we don't recognize. And the reason that is, is we don't practice. I wanted to show this. Actually, I'm gonna ask everybody to go online later and go to YouTube and Google volleyball player, sudden cardiac arrest, in Georgia. This is Claire. So I did some screenshots. And one of the main reasons is I wanna sell something that's so important to you guys. And when I mean sell it, I mean push it over the top. So Claire was at her volleyball game, grabs her chest, she falls over, she's dead. Within seconds, five or six people come running out of the stands. They call for an AED at 32 seconds. They continue CPR, they get the AED on her. And this is really, really important. So the, the AED begins analyzing and at 218 into this, the AED calls for a shock. And I want to take one step back and tell you all that not all AEDs are the same. The same story that happened here happened to my Lexi. That guy told me that when that AED said push the button, he nearly passed out. He didn't want to do it because he didn't want to hurt my daughter, but he just threw caution to the wind and he did it. The same thing here. I've read the, the, the story from the teacher that pushed this button. The reason that those two highlights are there, because at 218, that AED called for a shock and she didn't push the button. She waited. She was so afraid that she was going to hurt Claire. But with an AED, we all know it ain't going to shock unless that person needs a shock. 223, it called for a shock again. And she looked at her coworker and that coworker said, push the button. The cardiac signs G5, which a lot of schools have, once that AED goes on, if that person needs a shock, it does it. 
And I never realized how scary that is for people, but it is. Most people are not informed on how safe an AED is. And again, the story goes on and Claire survives. But if you have a minute, you need to please watch that because it's eye opening and it's shocking. So cardiac emergency response plan, there's a few steps to it. It's super easy, it's free. I'm gonna give you a link that's probably got five or six sites on there. So don't, don't uh, worry about money. Anytime I ever talk to schools or legislatures, money always comes up. So these are the steps, you build your team. Like I said, you could teach every teacher in your school hands-only CPR in an hour. I just did it on Tuesday. I just did it. I know it can be done. It's easy. Uh, but if you want the CPR certification, pick those people who you want to go to the three-hour class. But as a school nurse, as an athletic trainer, an administrator, I would make sure every single one of my teachers knew at least hands-only CPR. You want to document your plan. You want to call EMS and you want to collaborate with them. You want to make sure that your AEDs are accessible uh, and that they're properly working. And we're going to go into that. And then you want to conduct two to three drills a year. And I just want to go back to working with the local EMS. I've seen several lawsuits here in Florida where EMS was called. Nobody met them at the gate. They couldn't get to the football field. They had to jump the fence. They had to try to drive around to find another entrance. So your school and your athletic director and your nurse and whoever else needs to work with our local EMS folks. So when something does happen, remember that train is coming. One out of 25 schools has this coming to them. Uh, when it happens, you're there you have to open the gate and do whatever else needs to be done. We, uh, you need at least two to three drills. We get 11 fire drills a year in, the, in Florida. We haven't lost a kid in the United States to a fire in over 50 years, 1958 to be exact, in the whole United States. Develop your team. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but um, you know, it's basically a rehash of what I said. Who should be on it? Yes, the school nurse the coaches because 66% of kids drop in gym class or on the athletic field. How many AEDs do I need? Well, some of you, you're lucky if you have one, right? A lot of, a lot of states don't have any legislation on this. But remember we said if we can get that AED on them within three minutes, there's a nine out of 10 chance they're gonna get up off the floor. So two minutes. You need to have an AED in a place where you can get to it in two minutes. So if you have a big school, you might need three or four AEDs. If you have a small school, you might need one AED. Same thing on the athletic fields, right? Our high school, the, the athletic fields are probably 200 yards from the main building, at least. So you wanna have a, an AED out there at those fields. Two minutes, if you don't remember anything, two minutes, because by the time you open it, by the time you figure out where the pads are going, by the time it analyzes, you want to be able to push the button or allow the machine to shock itself. If you can get backup AEDs, God bless you. Uh, you know, so many, like I said earlier, so many of our schools don't even have one. But if you can have more, God, you know, good on you. And this is a formula, you know, I know. A lot of our principals and athletic directors and school board members are, are you know, like, um, you know, uh, engineers and guys that want exact numbers in math. Here you go. I'm not even going to try, but this is the formula for that. How about are your AEDs accessible? I took this picture myself. I took my son to a, a lacrosse camp and there was 500 kids there on a Saturday. And this is the sign. What if one of those kids would drop? What do we do? Do I knock on the door and hope that there's somebody, you know, sleeping in there that can hand me out the AED? No, we're basically at the mercy of EMS. How about the batteries? Is somebody checking these? Again, I have probably five slides worth of these. I'm not gonna show them, but these are all ones, the pictures I've taken myself of expired AEDs with dead batteries. 
and with dead, uh, or excuse me, expired pads. Nobody's checking them. They should be checked bare minimum once a, year, once a month, bare minimum. It should be more than that, but somebody's got to check. These are not, you know, throw them in the cabinet and don't ever look at them again. My daughter would not be here had not the owner of that gym looked at his AED two to three weeks before she dropped. Nobody was checking it. He happened to walk by and he saw that the light was blink was not blinking and there was it, it was dead. So thank God for us and, and our family that he bought a new battery and he bought new pads. And sure enough, something happened. And the guy was shaking and crying when he told me the story. But these AEDs you see here are in places where a lot of kids gather to play sports, like thousands. And this is what would happen. I tell a lot of people, you want to be held liable for a kid dying? You bring out an AED that's dead and, and go to use it and then be stunned when it doesn't work. And then drills. Again, I can't say it enough. Talk to your athletic director. Talk to your principals. Grab one of your CPR dummies and go out after school while your football team is practicing and throw it on the ground and just do a drill. We do these in the hospital. We see, uh, you know, patients every day. We deal with life and death, and yet we practice once a month. And again, I already said it. How do we expect the algebra teacher to respond when she doesn't see this? It's on us. It's on our leadership. It's on the school nurse who is the, the, the medical expert to step up. And don't be punitive about it, because I can almost guarantee I'd bet all my money that not many would know what to do. It happens every day. And here's some, you know, here's some uh, areas where you can get your cardiac emergency response plan for free. You don't need some expert to come in and tell you how to do it. If you want to spend the money and do it, that's beautiful. Do it. But you can do this. It's just practice, just like the fire drill. It's just practice. If you call your local fire department. They will come in and they will work with you. They will figure out the plan of attack and you should include them for reasons I mentioned earlier, but don't spend a dime. Click one of these and it'll handhold you right through the whole scenario. So funding your AED, right? This is really makes me, makes me crazy. I don't know how else to say it, but these are all the states in our country, you know, the ones that are in blue that have AED legislation. And I'm just going to click through this. Take a look at this list. Now, I do know that um, Tennessee and California now have a requirement. But if you can look at the area where the asterisks are, you will see that this, the state doesn't provide funding. So it comes to us. We're the ones, right? They'll pay for your, you know, your fire, your fire extinguisher. They'll pay for the crosswalk. They'll pay for the stop the bleed. But a lot of times you're on your own to try to get funding for your AEDs. So where do you get the money for this? How do you go about it? And this is really what we need to talk about because you guys are the leaders. You guys are the ones that, that are gonna you know, talk to the principal. You're their expert. So what do you do? We've talked about a lot of stats. Some people say, dang it, Sean, you gave us a lot of stats. I don't remember any of them. Print these slides, go to your principal, go before your school board, go to your local legislator with these stats. These stats don't lie, they're shocking. And if you're not shocked, then you are more informed than me, but they shock me every single time. And you need to print them and you need to use them because people are unaware. Share local stories, find your Lexi Sema, or worse, find a family who's lost somebody. We're all looking to give back. When, you, when you're affected by this, you want to give back. You either want to give back or some people crawl into their own place and you never hear from them again because you're never the same. But get those people to go with you. I do it every time I give a talk in a city. I go online and I print off 10 stories and I just screenshot the picture because most people don't hear about it. This isn't front page news. That kid is loaded up into the hearse 
he's taken to the to the funeral home there's a blurb in the newspaper and then you rarely ever hear anything about that kid find your politician i found me a school board member here in florida and that guy has been rocket fuel we have blasted off and this guy is just as passionate as i am but it took me going in and sitting down with him and telling him the facts and sharing stories and letting letting him know these statistics you know be nice with the media right the media is everything because now we have social media so that's helpful but the media will help get your story out and get it on the front page get it on the internet to inform people so what about hospital partners and i learned a lot from this actually because I'm one of those guys, I'm good at a lot of things. I, I'm good at talking, you know, as you see, I've been talking for, for you know, this long and I'm not tired yet, but I'm gonna try to cut it off here soon. But I'm not good about money. I don't wanna be the, oh no, here he comes guy, right? He's gonna ask me for something. How much money does he need now? But we have to, we have to swallow our pride because lives depend on it. But one of the big areas that people, uh, you know, where they go to get money is through hospitals, right? A lot of our hospitals have funds, you know, just waiting to, to, to donate on special projects, but we have to go in and get it. And that's where you grab the stats and you go in and you start with these departments, the community health benefits department. And I talked with the lady who's the head of one here on Sunday when I was putting these slides together. And again, I learned a lot, but find a foundation team, the marketing outreach. If you don't know any of these people, find a local cardiologist and go in and talk to them and share your story and share the problems and share how vulnerable our kids are at school. One thing I didn't realize too, is there's nonprofit hospitals and then there's for-profit hospitals. From what I understand, the for-profit hospitals are buying up the nonprofit hospitals. But the nonprofit hospitals are mandated. If they're going to keep their nonprofit status, they have to have a community benefit program. And that part of that program is focusing on unmet needs in the area. If you're in one of those states that doesn't have an AED policy, or um, if you do and they're not giving you any money for it, I would go here first and, and, and find out, is it a profit or for profit? Now the for-profits, they're a little bit tougher. They're not mandated and they have to answer to shareholders. So every time they give $5,000 for you to buy four or five AEDs, uh, they have to share that with their, with their shareholders. But uh, like my source told me the other day, if you can get one to support your cause, then you're set on a trajectory to get others because nobody wants to be outdone for the feel good stories. I always love to say, kids and puppies if you include those in anything your life will you're liable to get exactly what you want other sources these are no-brainers but the problem is is nobody understands this the pta you know the booster clubs uh the rotary clubs again kids and puppies when you share this information and i guarantee you, you will blow their mind when you share this information and you tell them that all this is going on but where our kids are not protected you're going to get money honestly i've been thinking about a lot this you go to school x we'll say vieira high school where i live if i went on uh their facebook page and i said you know mom and dad our kids go to a school that doesn't have an aed that doesn't have people specifically trained in cpr we have 2,000 kids in our school. If each parent would donate two to three dollars, we could buy three AEDs. Wouldn't you do that? I'll tell you, you'll do it. I've looked at my kid dead on the ground. And if you said, Mr. Seema, how about a thousand dollars? How about ten thousand dollars? How about a million dollars? How about everything that you own? You would do it because there's nothing like your kids. There's nothing. If your kid dies, what, what do you have to live for? Social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Amazon Smile, PayPal, you know, you can set those apps up where they'll donate money for an AED. 
Um, crowd sharing, again, that's like the uh, the GoFundMe. Got AED, you need to circle that and hold on to that because they donate a lot of AEDs into school systems. GoFundMe, again, to me, that's a no-brainer. I've thought a lot about it. Who wouldn't donate 2 to $3? Go talk to your local McDonald's and have a, an AED night. Most of these people have kids that go to the same school as yours. They are just uneducated. They don't understand. Again, this goes into a little bit of crowdfunding. Here's some sources, you know, Walmart, all these, all these companies have the feel good um, resources. Kids and puppies always win. You know, I'm, I'm sorry to sound, you know, uh, you know, trying to be funny, but it's the truth. You tell people that their kids are in danger, they're going to act and they're going to open up their wallets and give you the money that you need. And then I'm going to close with this. Last year, at the end of October, I did this briefing and, and, and did this webinar. And uh, on, that, um, on that call was my old commander. Like I said, I did 20 years in the Air Force. And one of the best commanders I ever had was right here at Patrick Air Force Base where I live. And uh, her name is Marlene Gardner, and she works up in Virginia. Um, so after I did this talk, I got a call from a lobbyist from Tennessee that was working with um, a congressman from Tennessee on trying to get an AED uh, resolution passed at the national level. So I sent an email to, to Colonel Gardner because I thought, who better than the National Association of School Nurses to help me? They're the experts. They're the ones that have all the clout. And she sent out this email to all of you. And I tried to reach out. I, I tried to send a, a copy of it. I don't know if uh, anyone ever got it, but I want to share this with you. And it's sort of hard to read, but the top line, you know, this is an actual bill that on December 18th that passed in our country. And it's House Resolution 35. It's an AED resolution. And if you want to Google it, Google House Resolution 35 for 2018, and you'll see what you guys were able to help me accomplish. We are the experts. People are going to listen. We have to act. It's up to us. You see your power. This was from uh, like a month and a half. We, we got together. Everybody that made calls, I appreciate it. But this is no-brainer stuff. This this prior bill had failed two to three other times. And this was like a last ditch effort. And the National Association of School Nurses, some other grassroots people, we were able to get it passed. You've seen those slides. There's so much work to be done. And that's why we need to work together. And you're gonna see my email. If there's any information, I want you to contact me. If you want an official copy of this, let me know. The National Association of School Nurses was huge with this. You got power. Our athletic trainers, you have power. In the state of Florida, we're lacking and we need you guys. And I'm gonna go ahead and close with, this is my Lexi. Uh, she was able to graduate. She's in nursing school right now uh, over in Orlando and she's alive and well. And uh, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean, for that wonderful information. Um, you are a very engaging presenter, and we, we've received actually feedback during this, uh, this last 45 minutes that people are just really, um, really pleased with the way that this time has gone so far. Um, we will go into a, a Q&A now for just a, a few minutes that we have left until the top of the hour. Um, I want to remind everybody if they've got questions for Sean, you can submit those through the questions interface and go to webinar. Uh, we've got a couple of, of questions that come in uh, that have come in so far. Um, just to address something that we mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, your certificate will come this afternoon uh, in, in the form of an email. School Health will send out an email that will have a link to your certificate on it. It will also have a link to uh, download the slides. That's a question that, that came in. And it will have a link to the recorded presentation, which will be hosted on the School Health YouTube channel. So to answer those questions that have come in so far, yes, we will send out an email this afternoon. 
with your slides, with your certificate, and uh, with a link to your uh, to where you can see the recorded presentation. Um, let me see. I actually I don't have any other questions that have come in for you, Sean. Your presentation was so good that you've answered everyone's questions. <laughs> Or they're all asleep, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that we've got a good and engaged audience out there. Like I say, we have received some yeah. good feedback. Um, I know that we've got a couple of our cardiac science partners on the call, and they're they're pleased with the way that things have gone. So, so that is uh, that's good. Um, good. Well, without any other questions, I will go ahead and uh, wrap up. Um, you know, can I add? Yeah, one well, thing I don't see, and I I don't know how I missed it. But um, could, could, is there a way you could add my email that if anyone does have any questions or runs into any roadblocks or if there's anything I can do? Yeah. Uh, I would like them to have that. And I welcome any kind of question or anything I can do to help through, you know, through a lot of this process. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So, so and, to, oh, we'll, for your, your request, Sean, we will add your email uh, to the email that goes out this afternoon. Um, okay. So for all attendees, um, Sean's email will be included in that email as well. So let's see. I just have some things that have come in here. A uh, question from Jenny. Do you have to be CPR certified to teach staff? For for the hands only, she didn't specify. But, but let's let's just answer both for hands only. Um, hands only, you don't. And actually, there's kits that are out there that uh, they do all the teaching. One of the biggest roadblocks we run into um, when we are trying to do the required CPR for graduation was, well, who's going to teach it? Um, a lot of our teachers are already overtaxed. So the way the program is set up, like the American Heart has a program, you don't have to be an, an you know an instructor. You just put the the CD in and, and follow the prompts. You don't have to be an instructor. Yeah, it yeah. helps if you have some you know some um, experience, but it's not required. And then obviously for CPR certification, where you're a card holder, then yes, you have to have a certified trainer. Um, educator to to put you through the three hour course, but hands only you do not. Well, and that's a that's a good thing to mention, Sean. We just from School Health sent out an email this morning on the A American Heart Association's CPR in Schools kit. Um, that kit will teach uh, up to twenty people uh, to be CPR certified, and it is it is as you say it's it's very easy to use. So. If you're signed up for school health emails, you'll have received that email this morning about the American Heart Association CPR and Schools Kit. Um, so that is an excellent resource. Um, let me see. I think that that's going to take us to about time for today. Um, after we finish uh, the webinar, you'll receive a brief survey as you close your webinar window. The survey is going to pop up from GoToWebinar, and if you just take a few moments to fill out, there's only like six or seven questions. If you just take a few moments to, to fill out the survey, that really helps us to understand, um, you know, how how today's presentation went, what you might like to have seen different, um, what we could do better, what uh, what worked for you as it was. So, take a moment to participate in the survey, and with that, we'll let uh, Sean go about his day. And we'll let all of you get back to your day. Uh, thanks for joining us for our Sudden Cardiac Arrest Month webinar. Um, thanks to our partners at Cardiac Science for participating with us and, and partnering to put this webinar on. Have a wonderful day. Thank you all.